Good evening, a fine Monday evening to you. This is Ron Price. Welcome to Together as One. You know, i got to be honest, I've been doing this two years. I think every guest I've had is, has been pretty special, but tonight's is certainly no exception. Elliot Connie, are you there, sir? I am here. You know, that's always such a great relief when I hear the other person's voice <laughs> on the <laughs> phone. <laughs> it would be a real different program if I had to do both our voices. Elliot Connie and I met in January... When you put on a wonderful, you know, I got a lot of trainings. I've been accused of being a training junkie, but uh, but that course that you put on in Albuquerque was certainly a highlight. Introduce yourselves to our listeners, listening audience, please. Who is Elliot Connie? Uh, well, my name is Elliot Connie, and I am a uh, psychotherapist. I practice in uh, a place called Keller, Texas, which, uh, if you're not familiar with that area of the world, uh, there's Dallas and then Fort Worth. Most people know those cities, and then right in the middle is an area called Mid-Cities, and uh, Keller is one of the Mid-Cities, and that is where I practice. Okay. Uh, I originally grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, but now, of course, make my home here in Texas. And um, yeah, we'll see if there's anything else you guys like to know about me. You know, we may talk, on, I mean, you're going to think I'm kidding, but we may talk about why you're not a Red Sox fan, having grown up in Massachusetts, because <laughs> people who know me, no, I've told your story, Elliot, I've, it's, it's poignant <laughs> Uh, especially because right. I'm key on the on the the fact that our childhood wounds will will impact us today. So we'll we'll tease our audience. We'll see if that comes back into the conversation yeah. or not. No, but, no, no. A childhood wound has definitely led to this. Yes, but you are you are working on your doctorate. How close are you, sir? I am weeks. I mean, very very close. I'm at the absolute end. I I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in professional counseling. And, uh, just at the very, very end, I've done everything except uh, had my research approved. Okay. Uh, so that's it. Yeah. Okay. Tail end. And are we all invited to the celebration party? The, it is going to be a worldwide. So I'm going to scream from the mountaintops of celebratory noises. I can believe that. I, I can believe that. Elliot, thank you for writing that column yesterday in the Daily Times. By the way, I I always appreciate it when when folks in our and I'll put myself, all right, I'm in the field of marriage enrichment as well. People need to know that any marriage is going to endure difficulties and hardships. It doesn't marry, mean you sure. married the wrong person just because there's trouble in the marriage. Absolutely. Absolutely right. And yet, totally agree. And yet that's, is that kind of what led you, forgive me if I'm off, but I want to talk about solution-focused therapy tonight. I want our listeners to know what that's all about. So why don't I just leave, give you that blank check Take it wherever well, you want to go, please. Uh, sure. Um, you know, solution-focused therapy is interesting, and, it, and it's a really difficult thing for me uh, to talk about. I mean, I always, people will hire me to give three- and four-day lectures, and I always think, gosh, how am I going to explain this? How am I going to keep this going for three or four days? And if I only have three or four minutes, I think, gosh, how am I going to get it out in three or four minutes? <laughs> Excuse me. But um, most of the time, psychotherapy can best be articulated as an exploration of problem or flaw or history. So um, psychotherapy will, uh, a, a psychotherapist may very often open up a session with the question, what brings you here today? Which would elicit the client to say something like, um, you know, I'm depressed or I argue with my spouse or whatever the identification of the problem is. Right. And then, and then there, are other, there are other forms of psychotherapy where they are very interested in a, uh, in a historical exploration. Uh, you know, even, even some people going back to your infant stages, how did your mother treat you, how did your father treat you, and how did you form attachments and those types of things. But when I was in graduate school, um, because of my personal life, those forms of uh, psychotherapy did not resonate with me. Uh, I have a very um, kind of complicated and at times extremely difficult story in my own childhood. And uh, I was in graduate school at a time where I wanted uh, to move on. And I, I was beginning to understand that there was nothing I could do to change my past, um, but I wanted to do something to change my future. And as I was studying psychotherapy, uh, none, of those kind of, none of those traditional approaches resonated with me. And then I was introduced to this thing called solution-focused brief therapy. Um, which could best be articulated as a preferred future perspective approach to psychotherapy. So instead of being interested in problem or history, uh, solution-focused brief therapist is quite interested in 
uh, the future that you would like to create using your own resources. And that made sense to me because my, my past was so difficult and complicated and, you know, I was wrestling with how do I become who I want to become from a past where I come from. Uh, but now here's this thing that says every human being has resources and you gather those resources and you start uh, kind of building towards the future and it instantly resonated with me. And I began to study, this is all the way back in 2004, 2005, I began to do nothing but study this approach. And I've had the amazing opportunity to, to be trained by some of the world leaders in this approach. And I now conduct a lot of research and trainers with these folks. Um, but what led me to doing this work with couples is I think, uh, and you were kind of alluding to it earlier today, I think people have a tendency we get into a relationship, and it's so euphoric, and it's so beautiful. And You know, I learned the solution-focused approach, and it really resonated with me. And at the time, to be perfectly honest, uh, I was working with uh, adolescents and their families, and, and I foresaw that as the future I would be doing as a professional. Uh, but God had different uh, plans for me, and um, <clears throat> I started working at a child and family center, and uh, I remember telling the referral coordinator to don't send me any couples because I saw the worst couple in the history of couples, mm. and all they did was argue as I was growing up. <clears throat> so the professional, I don't want to, you know, begin that work. And uh, this referral coordinator just started sending me couples, <laughs> and uh, I started finding myself loving it. I started finding mm. myself almost becoming addicted to watching people fall back in love, <clears throat> and. I started noticing that people would come into therapy because a problem had popped up. They'd begun to accept the idea that because a problem had arisen, they either were never or are no longer right for each other. And then they stopped doing the work of building a relationship. And I found this uh, unusual. I found this uh, troubling almost uh, because you know, no matter what sea you're sailing on, the water's going to get choppy. And the same thing is true in relationships. Like, no matter how euphoric the relationship was in the beginning, eventually you're going to have children, you're going to relocate, you're going to get a stressful patch in your job. I mean, that's just the way life kind right. of flows. Right. And I started noticing that if I use solution-focused language in session and I gear people's conversations towards love and commitment and... uh success and tomorrow, then their focus went away from the flaws and problems and began to be about strength, and people would kind of reestablish beautiful relationships quite quickly. And uh, it motivated me to, to do that work, and I've been doing it now for uh, close to 10 years. And, uh, you know, I'm now uh, very, very motivated to demonstrate that solution-focused brief therapy is an adequate approach to working with couples. And that's what we're going to do in the next couple of segments. Folks, thanks for tuning in tonight to Together as One. Our guest is the soon-to-be Dr. Elliot Connie, And we're talking about an approach to your marriage that I promise you is going to make a lot more sense. I think it already is, but we have plenty more in store, so I hope you can stay tuned. We'll be right back in just a few moments. Welcome back to segment two of tonight's Together as One. Ron Price, your host, visiting with Elliot Connie. I could swear you said you're from Killer, Texas, but I guess it was more Keller, Texas. Is that? <laughs> yeah, Keller, K-E-L-L-E-R. Yeah, Killer, like Texas. That, Just, I don't know, somehow has a different ring to it. But uh, <laughs> talking about, you know, probably I got a... a good place for a therapist to be from. Well, that's probably true, too. Yeah, Killer is not, yeah, okay. We, uh, I, I got a master's in counseling. I don't use it, Elliot, to be honest with you. I'm more of a coach and an educator. I never got licensed as a counselor, but... You know, I remember Freud and Jung and Adler and all these other approaches. I don't remember. This was in uh, 89 to 93. Was solution-focused therapy well-known at all in those days? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't, I didn't enter graduate school until the early 2000s um, or, or even mid-2000s. Uh, so I don't know when it entered into education. But I know the approach was developed by Steve DeSager and Insu Kimberg in uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the in the mid '70s. And um, I mean, they had an inch, they had a uh, kind of an organic fascination with people's hope and uh, a future focused perspective, just as I was discussing earlier, became my fascination before I even knew what solution focused therapy was. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about it, like whenever we form relationships, you know, I always have a hard time 
because sometimes as I teach psychotherapists, they have a hard time believing in people and learning uh, uh, or believing that an approach can actually be effective if you just focus on hope. And um, if you think about it, it actually doesn't, it's not that surprising. Uh, and relationships is a good example of this, because whenever we enter into a relationship, uh, we're almost 100% going to get into conversations about strength and resources and the future. And that's actually how we build relationships. Like on first dates, we say stuff like, so where do you see yourself in the future? And, uh, and we tell our partners or our, our hopeful soon-to-be partners what we like about ourselves, and we're extremely complimentary about what we like about the other person. Yeah. That hope and that activity is actually activity, the activity of building relationships. So it's not that surprising that uh, professionally you can have similar conversations and people can kind of get on with their lives in a more useful and productive way. Um, so some of the, the kind of ideas and tenets behind this approach is, uh, you know, there's, there's these kind of, I don't know, I don't mean, want to be overly technical, but these ideas of things like, you know, something's not broken, don't fix it, uh, meaning that if something in your life is working, just because someone else might find it unusual or unproductive in their, in their life doesn't mean you have to change it in yours. And if something is found to be working, you should do more of it. Uh, we all have things in our lives that are that are working, and we should just you know spend more time doing those things. And uh, surprisingly, when we do that, we the the outcome is usually more happiness, more joy, more peace, more love, uh, all the positive things. Um, and um, there are always exceptions to all of our problems. Uh, you know, this is quite fascinating. Because people don't really think about problems in this way. But whenever you have a problem, there must be a time in your life where the problem is less potent or even not present. Okay. And by focusing on those times, we develop our skills to help overcome the problem. Like, for example, couples will come into my office all the time and they'll say things like, we always fight. Well, that's an unusual statement because if you always fought 100% of the time, then you never would have been able to develop the skills to build this appointment, this therapy appointment into your life. So what people are really saying is, we fight a lot. But when you're not fighting, what are you doing and how do you make that happen? And by focusing on times when the problem is not present or even less potent, we develop the strength to overcome the problem. And then uh, this idea that the future is creatable, and I was alluding to that, to that earlier, and the future really is creatable. I talked about my own complicated and at times difficult past. Uh, you know, I had a situations with my parents that were not so easy to deal with as a child and my, my father struggled with anger quite a bit and the way he demonstrated his anger on his family was not always the most productive way you could do things and uh, it was tough it was very very uh it was very tough for me to grow up and I grew up feeling like my life was different than the lives of everybody around me like somehow uh, the example I used to give to people was it's almost like all of us have a 1,000 piece puzzle to put together but I had to figure, it, figure out a way to put my puzzle together on a bed of rocks mm. instead of on a flat surface Yeah, <clears throat> and it was, it was really really tough but when I accept the idea that my past does not have to become my future then it opens up the ability for me to believe in myself to become something productive uh, like a doctor and things like that and, and you know I, I have a very fortunate life uh, I enjoy the work that I do and I've written a few books and get to travel uh, as a consequence of writing those books. And, you know, I've been to the far reaches of, a, of the world, and I still pinch myself because there was once a time where I wasn't even sure I would be alive, let alone be on a safari in South Africa or taking a walk in London or giving a lecture in Canada or Sweden or whatever the case may be. Yeah, well, let me... Let, so, <laughs> Elliot, may, if I may, let me, let me step in just for a moment or finish that thought. Go ahead, if you, if you want to finish that thought. Well, I just, I, I just think it's so incredibly important that whenever we are faced with a problem that we remember, I can, the future can start from here, and you can build and become whatever you'd like to become. Yeah, I like that, I, and I do, and I, we'll come back to that in a moment, I promise. But um, again, all kidding aside, you grew up in, in Boston and 
were invited to Fenway Park and, uh, in quotes, a friend invited you to go to a ball game and stuck a New York Yankees hat on your head. And, <laughs> and you and I were able to laugh about that, but I understand Boston Red Sox fans in Fenway Park. That was, that right. was a horrible thing to do. I also, I'm not going to get into any more graphic details than you have tonight, but you shared with us that day, your, your father was not a father, Elliot, um, and we're not going to diss him right now. I mean, he had his own issues, but, but you, were, you, you were not raised the way a loving father would raise a son. So, so the, I say all that because solution focus looks future. How do you, how do you escape or how do you, how do you deal with that past to be able to move future? Um, well, that's a really good question. I can only say that when I was about 19 years old, uh, I mean, I was depressed, and, and in fact, I would go as far as saying even suicidal. And I, I, I made the decision that if I were to take my own life, I remember being scared that no one would understand. Like, everyone would think I killed myself or I took my life because I'm depressed. And that wasn't the full story. The full story was I was hopeless because of the past that I had. Yeah. So what I decided was from now on, I have no idea. I was 19 years old. I remember this like it was yesterday. I have no idea if this will work, lead to my happiness, success, or positive outcome, whatever. But I now know that for the rest of my life, I'm going to live with my own skills, attributes, and even my own flaws. But I'm no longer willing to experience the deficits of someone else's problems in my life. Wow. And it was, it was earth-shattering to me because now all of a sudden, I wasn't some loser kid who was doing badly in life because his dad uh, had all of these problems, I now became uh, someone who had survived that. Yeah, yeah. So it became a source of my strength as opposed to evidence of my weakness. Well, hold that thought right there, Elliot, because I do want to come back to more of that, because every one of us were wounded when we were young, and that's that's a, such a source of encouragement, what you're sharing right now. Folks, you're listening to the soon-to-be Dr. Elliot Connie. From Keller, Texas, got plenty more to share about some things that I promise you are impacting your marriage as we live and breathe, so you want to stay tuned for segment three. Welcome back to Together as One. Ron Price, your host, visiting with Elliot Connie, talking about solution-focused brief therapy. I want to come back and explain those terms in just a few moments, but But again, Elliot, we were sharing in the last segment that every one of us were wounded. None of us comes out of childhood unscathed. I was going to say alive, but uh, we're we're beat up pretty good. You were actually able to heal yourself, to to talk yourself out of letting the past be your present or future? Um, I I, I would hesitate to say heal myself. I I think, uh, you know, to be honest, I think God kind of took control of my life over a long period of time there. Uh, you know, a really funny story related to that. When I was uh, I was dating this girl in college, and I went into her dorm room, and uh, it was kind of the lowest, lowest time uh, of my life of this period. And I walked into her dorm room, and we were about to go to the cafeteria to have lunch. And um, she said, hey, can you wait here one second? got to go do something. And I said, sure. And I sat on her bed, and I turned and uh, looked on the wall. And on the wall, she had a poster of the poem Footprints. Ah. Now, I had never before seen it. I had never heard it. Uh, How I got to be 19 years old, and that be a true statement, I do not know. But (laughs) (laughs) I had never before seen it or heard it. Yeah. So just out of sheer boredom, I mean, this is in the 90s, so it's pre-internet and cell phone and, you know, those sorts of things. I just start reading this poster on her wall. And when I got to the end, and it says, you know, my son, my precious child, uh, when you saw just one set of footprints, it was then I was carrying you. I began to cry. I began to weep uh, uncontrollably because I knew at that moment I was going to be okay. Wow. Uh, I was the most alone I'd ever felt in my life, and I knew at that moment that, in essence, there was just one set of footprints in my life. So, so I hesitate to say I healed myself uh, because I, I, I think there were divine interventions taking place in my life. Yeah. Having said that, <clears throat> I think that you can you can change your perspective. And like I said, my story became much less about my problem and much more about my strength of dealing with that problem. And I remember one day, uh, you know, the difficulties that I experienced as a child lasted for as long as I can remember. So whatever age memory develops, I remember, you know, fights and arguments and yelling and hitting and all the horrible things that happened. 
And the last time it happened, I was 19 years old. And I remember sitting and thinking, if someone had told me that at the age of 10, you're 10 years old and uh, you're going to have to deal with this for 11 or nine more years, I don't think I had the, I don't think I would have had the strength to do it. Yeah. But <clears throat> that forces me to ask the very poignant question of then how did I do it? And now that's about my strengths and my faith and uh, the support of people around me and not anymore about my father and his problems or, or my problems associated with that. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, I love the whole, the whole emphasis that, with, there are going to be problems. Just accept that. Start with that as the premise. Well, if there are problems, therefore there should be also solutions. So, so that solution well, focus. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I was just going to kind of expound upon that. Like, yes, there are going to be problems, and and we have to we have to see those problems through a different lens. Like a really good example in relationships. Uh, my wife and I view money in completely different ways. Yeah. Uh, she's much more of a saver. She's much safer. She's much more conservative. And I'm a huge risk taker, and I will uh, take all kinds of risks and at times spend frivolously and all of that. Now, <laughs> we can fight about the way we view money, uh, and that's an easy thing to do. I mean, I can pretty much cause an argument any time I want just by bringing up money. <laughs> or I can be grateful and thankful that God put someone in my life who will make sure I don't do something too risky. And my wife can enjoy that that I am, because I take risks, there's a little bit more money to save and, and be conservative with. Yeah. So when you view the differences as, in fact, strengths, then we don't argue about them. And if you look at it as it's an us, it's not your way or my way. We don't. We do exist. Come on. But 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 no. There's, we've created a new reality that is us that needs the best of both. Absolutely. We 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 really. I mean, I know it's an overstated ideology, but we really do function as a team. Like right. as I'm doing this interview, I have a. I'm a big sports fan, so I have the NBA playoffs on in the background. And ah. one of the teams that no one can figure out why they keep winning is the San Antonio Spurs. And the way that they keep winning is they function as an they, organism. They're a team. There so, yes, go. there are individuals. There are yep. five different people on the court. Yep. But there's one organism. Yep. And um, my wife and I hope to form one organism, even though we're two different people. I like it. I like it. So, so people come to me. Again, I'm a marriage coach and educator. People come and... You know, they don't often ask, but they often wonder, well, how long is this going to take? How many times are we going to have to come? Right. Define the brief for us, please, in solution-focused brief well, therapy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right. I mean, couples will come to my office and say, like, how long are we going to do this? And brief simply means we're going to treat every single session as if it's the last time we'll meet. So when people ask me that, I have no way of knowing. I can't give a definitive answer. This is absolutely not like a an 18-week program or a 24-week program, uh, it's over when the client achieves their goals. And I've had experiences where the client achieved their goals in one session, and I've had experiences where it took 20 sessions. But it's over when the goal uh, has some level of completion. Okay. And that one session more, that's that's a good way to put that. And that one session more. All right. Absolutely. All right. Well, we've got a couple of minutes if you left. Think about it, right? yes. Okay. No. Well, I was going to say, if you think about it, problems get bigger if you anticipate the problem gets bigger. So if I say, we're going to need to do this for 24 weeks, I guarantee you it'll take 24 weeks because that's how, that's how big the problem is. Okay. It'll expand to fill the time period, huh? <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. So uh, we got a couple of minutes left, minute and a half or so. Uh, encourage people, if they're struggling in their marriage, to consider going to your website or looking into Solution Focus. I'm giving you permission to do a commercial please. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm so not good at this. Um, well, if you're out there and you're married and you're interested in Solution Focus Brief Therapy uh, to help your relationship, I'll give you two resources. Uh, I've written a book that you might be interested in called The Solution Focused Marriage, and you can find that book at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you know, wherever they sell, uh, all the major booksellers. Um, and then also you can go to my website, which is uh, thesolutionfocusedmarriage.com. Uh, and it'll have all of the information related to that book and uh, things you can do to help your relationship immediately uh, on that site. And if you want to know more about me, just go to uh, www.elliot, E-L-L-I-O-T-T, -T, speaks, S-P-E-A-K-S, 
dot com, and you'll find out about me and my work and who I am and where I lecture and all those things. I like it, Elliot. How's that for a commercial? You know, that was wonderful. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. That's why I do this program. I've been doing this for two years. I want people to know a couple of things. One, you're going to have problems in your marriage. Hello. My wife and I have problems. You and your <laughs> column. You know, you're, you focus on marriage, helping yeah. other people. You admitted that your marriage was in deep, deep trouble sometime past. So people need to know that, but they also need to know there's help, there's resources. And folks, I'm just going to give a huge amen. Go to the solutionfocusedmarriage.com. Get, get a copy of, of Elliot's book. Uh, learn some of these things, exercises you can apply as a couple, just all sorts of resources. You'll be so glad you did. Elliot, thank you for spending this, this time with us this evening. I've so enjoyed this. No problem. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Well, and maybe maybe we'll even get to do it again after you get that doctorate, after you're, you're an official smart guy. We'll, uh... <laughs> it, it would be an honor. <laughs> well, all, all, mine, all mine for sure. Thank you so much, folks. I don't know who our guest is next week, but we hope to see you again with more Together as One.